Welcome to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series, co-sponsored by the Water Resources Center and the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, both at the University of Minnesota. I am John Gulliver, and I will introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Dr. Robert Pitt, the Emeritus Cudworth Professor of Urban Water Systems in the Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at the University of Alabama. Bob's major interest is in stormwater management, especially the integration of drainage and water quality objectives. For more than 40 years, he has conducted research for the US EPA, Environment Canada, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, and many states and local governments concerning the beneficial uses, effects, sources, and control of wet weather, wet weather flows. In fact, you could call him the godfather of stormwater quality improvements because many of the firsts in the area. For example, Bob was a member of the technical advisory group for the EPA's Nationwide Urban Runoff Program or NERP. He initiated and developed the source loading and management model or WinSLAM. He has prepared manuals of practice which contain procedures and construction specifications for stormwater and erosion control practices. He published a statistical analysis of the MPDES database, which I have re referenced in virtually all of my articles on stormwater. He co-authored the Stormwater Effects Handbook, a toolbox for watershed managers, which I have on my bookshelf. In 1996, he authored the book, Groundwater Contamination from Stormwater, a very early realization of the impacts which I also have on my bookshelf. He has studied nutrient retention, metal retention, PAH contamination, optimized drainage options for bioretention systems, groundwater impacts from infiltration, beneficial uses of stormwater in times of changing weather conditions, source and fate of indicator bacteria in urban areas, continued enhancement to stormwater water quality models like Winslam. He has also carried out a number of receiving water impact studies, including water and sediment quality, fish and benthos taxonomic composition, and laboratory toxicity tests. So you can say that if it relates to water quality and stormwater runoff and treatment, Bob has done it. In fact, he initiated the research in most of these areas. Bob has a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an MS in environmental engineering slash hydraulic engineering from San Jose State University and a BS in engineering science from Humboldt State University in California. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert Pitt. Well, thank you. Who, under who that guy was that you were talking about? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate being invited to participate you know, on uh, this program, you have a tremendous amount of distinguished predecessors to uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. So I guess I'll share my screen and here, okay, it says share. Okay, there we go. Up and about. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about some topics that I and my research group had been working on for the last 10 or 15 years, and that's specifically looking at the spatial and temporal scaling, you know, basically dealing with space and time, you know, uh, biofiltration media performance data, and also updates to WinSLAM. Basically, we have a lot of information available on small scale studies, short term studies, a tremendous database from that. And we're looking at how that information can be expanded and how effective it is on, a, on, a, on the larger scale. So I'm going to be. Uh, doing uh, a presentation, if I can get going here. Here we go. Ah, there you go. Hit the right button. It'll help. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm going to uh, give very, very brief summaries on several research projects that, that we have been involved with that ad address these scaling issues, uh, mainly focusing on those that are dealing with media treatment infiltration. And also, I'll, as I mentioned, we'll talk about uh, at the end, some updates to WinSLAM that we've been working on trying to incorporate this information. The significant issues I think that exist in this field of utilizing these uh, stormwater controls are these distributed controls spread throughout a watershed effective in reducing the outfall discharges because that's usually our goal 
in most situations? And also, can our results from these small scale laboratory or pilot scale uh, experiments be upscaled to the large long term installations? We're also interested in how robust the stormwater controls are for extended periods of time. And also, as mentioned, you know, we have come across unintended consequences associated with groundwater characteristics associated with a lot of our control performances and concerned about the potential for groundwater contamination. So the first project I'm going to talk about here is the Santa Susana Field Lab in Ventura County, California near LA. This was a uh, it's a 2,800 acre former federal government rocket testing and energy research facility that operated on the site for about 40 years. And I've been involved in a, a surface water expert panel that we've been trying to uh, develop stormwater controls and, and reduce exceedances of, of, of a number of different pollutants associated with the legacy contaminants on this site as we <clears throat> wait for the Department of Toxic Substances Control in California to develop and present the final cleanup plan uh, for this area. So our goal is to, to minimize the, the movement of this material from the site into the stormwater itself. Currently, the activities are limited to demolition of facilities, uh, remediation, and also restoration, and of course, treatment of stormwater and other things. The future use of this area will be open space and parkland. It's a very beautiful site. You know, it, the surrounding area uh, was used uh, in, in the olden days for filming Westerns. It was a lot closer to Hollywood than Sedona, Arizona, I guess, but it is, uh, uh, will be a, a, a major recreational resource for the area. The monitoring activities at the site are, are very extensive. They've been going on since at least 2010, over 2,400 samples. Each time it rains at any of the regulated outfalls, a sample has to be taken and analyzed for anywhere from 10 to 90 constituents. So over the years, we've had over 20,000 individual monitoring results. And you see the list here, which is a partial listing of the constituents that are uh, uh, examined here, but they're mainly, you know, particular size distributions, heavy metals, radiological constituents, and dioxins and furans. There, the screening also occurs once a year for a large number of additional constituents, including volatiles, which we generally don't see in the stormwater, but we are looking at a subset of these when we monitor at our site selection and control locations and monitoring the performance of our control activities but we have tracked the performance at the MPDES regulated outfalls over this period of time. Initially, uh, uh, we developed a um, treatment media that we felt would be effective in treating the broad list of constituents of concern. Shirley Clark at Penn State Harrisburg and I at the University of Alabama did extensive laboratory tests using long-term column tests, using actual stormwater to look at clogging breakthrough and pollutant removal, uh, effects of contact time and median depth on that removal, and also traditional batch tests to look at kinetics and uptake characteristics, and also the stability of the captured material under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. A, a summary of, of these tests are shown here on a couple of plots here of what we conducted. The, on the right plot, we see concentrations of, of copper influent versus effluent during the, these long-term column tests. And we we're focusing on the media, of course, that would consistently uh, produce an effluent that would be lower than the 14 microgram per liter uh, criteria here that we have on the benchmark and limitation for copper as an example. On the left side, this funny little circle diagram, we have the 10 major uh, com components and mixtures that we examine during these long-term tests. The orange line on the outside is the average initial flow rate that we obtained at these sites, you know, during these tests. And the internal blue uh, circle-ish thing is the a load produced onto these columns before initial maintenance was required in kilograms per square meter. 
So our, our selected media based upon a number of different criteria, mainly performance, but also hydraulic characteristics and clogging was, was this mixture of a rhyolite sand, a, a surface modified zeolite and a granular activated carbon mixed volume by volume uh, equal amounts. So um, we use this material at the, at the full size media facilities at the site. Boeing has also used this at some of their other facilities for other issues too. Some of our uh, test results here in, with this media indicate our ability to retain particulates down to a, a small size fraction, which we find in stormwater, of course, is typically the, the goal as most of our pollutants are associated with the particulates and trying to get down to these smaller particles uh, is pretty important. So in this situation, we see that we have quite good removal down to about uh, three microns, three micrometers you know, for this. And more importantly, our effluent concentrations are very low, which was our, our main goal versus the percent reduction, of course. We were also concerned about breakthrough capacity versus the time to clogging during these issues, because uh, even though we're doing a tremendous amount of monitoring, there is you know, a lag time before a sample is taken, before we get the results back and analyze the data, it could be several months, as you all know. And so the primary method for evaluating need for maintenance in the field is going to be associated with you know, extended ponding on top of these uh, devices. And so we wanted to uh, ensure that in our primary constituents had capacity left in the media be, you know, after it was clocked. And so if we are able to see rehab ponding and, and we do uh, media removal or restoration of the site, you know, we likely did not have breakthrough at that, of that uh, material. And so again, as shown here, our blended uh, material did pretty well. Our primary considerations are, are lead and the dioxins, you know, and so we had several orders of magnitude or several times additional capacity when clogging occurred compared to some of the others. Interestingly, when we looked at a layered uh, process using this media, we didn't have quite as effective a performance, mainly because the clogging occurred a lot earlier and we had lower flow rates compared to the blended mixture because of the multiple interfaces of the, of the different layers in the material. And also we had uneven contact times with the different media. We've always felt, and we found this with our, a lot of our media studies, you know, that a blended mixture seems to perform better in most situations. This is a uh, map showing two of our main study areas on the site. As I mentioned, it's about 2,800 acres. This is about 1,000 acres here in these two, two sub watersheds that we focused on for the distributed controls. <clears throat> The other sub area watersheds were able to be dealt with it and the pipe controls as they were much smaller, but these uh, were more difficult to deal with that because of topography and other constraints on the site. The blue labels here correspond to our potential stormwater control locations that we were concerned about or wanted to examine that had uh, industrial activity or anthropogenic activity, you know, upstream of those locations in the watersheds. The green locations are background sites where there was no uh, known activity above those locations. And then we had our two outfalls here that uh, also uh, were uh, monitored, of course. So we had about 50 performance locations, uh, 12 background sites, and up to 21 potential storm or control sub areas that were monitored every time it flowed, in addition to the two NPDES regulated outfalls. Overall, there are 12 regulated outfalls at the Santa Susana, Susana site, but here we're just focusing on, on two of those. We have a tremendous amount of information. The way we examined these sub areas and selected uh, critical locations for our initial activities were plotting basically the probability of the concentrations versus uh, uh, for the background conditions. So the background conditions here are this best fit line Samples that were greater in, in the vertical line here is the permit limit in this example. So the highest priority uh, sites and samples occurred when our uh, concentrations were above the background limit and also above the background uh, above the permit limit. Our second priority was 
samples that were above the permit limit, but actually below the background permit uh, background conditions, because we did have a again a number of locations and background conditions that were above the the permit conditions. Lower priorities, of course, were associated with concentrations below the permit limits, especially if it was below the background. Either that had no priority at all as far as our evaluations are concerned. But if we're above the background, but lower than the permit limit, we also looked at that too. This is an example of looking at lead, you know, for a series of data that was from several years ago. The, the red vertical line here is the corresponds to 5.2 micrograms per liter, the permit limit for lead at this location. The black line here is the best fit line for the uh, probability distribution for the background concentrations. So the red cl uh, the cluster here of, of green triangles that I circled in red were the highest priority conditions that we're concerned about because they exceeded the permit limit, but also uh, exceeded the background conditions. As an example, then we would look at the locations associated with those samples and rank them. Our ranking was associated with a number of different attributes, you know, obviously the concentrations of primary constituents of concern, the metals and the dioxins, basically, and also looking at the fraction of the samples that were uh, exceeding based upon the number of samples that were obtained. We use a chi-square distribution for a weighting factor associated with that. So this is an example of applying the weighting factors with the data that we had, the individual ranks, and we can, uh, in this situation from several years ago, we see the top eight locations that we wanted to deal with that year. And, and for, at that point, looking at each of these locations, we decided if you know if we had an existing control device there, we wanted to see how that could be enhanced, or if there was nothing there, then we determined what would best work at that location and then go into the design for that. So that was that's an ongoing process. We did that for a number of years to come up with our control practices on the site itself. So we look at the uh, site and the, the number of different or the amount of area that's treated by these uh, different control practices. The large blue areas are treated what we call by culvert modifications. These were put in very early in our evaluation of the site because these are simply culvert uh, crossings of roads. And so we were able to put up flashboards in front of the culverts and divert the stormwater through adjacent uh, media beds. And we also enhanced usually sedimentation above that area too. So those were put in initially uh, done relatively quickly. Most of them are undersized compared to what we would like to do, but we, we knew that. The other areas, we had more sophisticated systems that we developed. This is an administration area and also had a lot of the research uh, going on for the whole site. This is a area here that where they were doing liquid oxygen uh, tests so, and, and filling and processing for the uh, rocket engine tests. And over here, we're adjacent to some of the energy areas and, and other features. And so we have, again, a number of different types of controls that we have on the site for the types of problems that we observed. And you see that much of the area is passing through at least one stormwater control device, if not a, a series of them. There was an awful lot of erosion control also that was uh, used on this site in order to stabilize the soils. Whenever we saw any type of erosion problems occurring, that was that was. We also had stability of the of the main drainage channel that is continually being investigated and and uh, worked on. So talking about bio filters again in our media. So this is how the media was prepared. We had individual bags. You know the the big uh, cubic meter bags. You know of the different media that were. Uh, from the, from the trucks that would go into the bags. Then the bags were mixed uh, together in proportion, uh, equal amounts of the three components into a mixer. And then it was placed into our finished final bags for placement on the uh, location sites. Again, we, we used a tremendous number, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cubic yards of this material. So these are uh, photographs of a couple of our example uh, situations. I mentioned our culvert modifications, and this is an example of one where we see the flashboard in front of the inlet to the culvert going underneath the roadway here. 
and we had uh, the, the media bed you know, that the water was forced through and then we had under drains collecting that water. And then we had a ponding area, you know, above that. We also had a larger flow through media bed filters, you know, such as this. And, and then we had a large uh, sedimentation biofilter system that was also put in. Uh, and again, we have multiples of these. And this is what we call our red, the Red Dragon, which is above ground kind of a temporary facility which uh, basically included two sedimentation tanks and then one media tank, you know, in the center. That was the water was being pumped up into that system. So we had a number of different types of controls that were used in the media <clears throat> with and without the vegetation. Obviously, this guy didn't include the vegetation compared to uh, the, the big biofilter. The culvert mods and the other biofilters did not. So our question was again comparing our early laboratory tests with our field tests. We had six to nine years of full-scale field performance, you know, and we had our laboratory test data. So these are box and whisker plots. The orangish uh, box are associated, you know, with the uh, influent characteristics, the concentrations, you know, the midline here is the median, the 25th and the 75th percentile, and then we had the whiskers that were outside of that range. And then of course the effluent conditions, which hopefully are a lot smaller. So these are the full scale field test results for the, the big biofilters, the bioswales and the ELV uh, red dragon device as an example. These guys here, these are culvert modifications <clears throat> that were installed actually at ended up being in background locations. So our concentration in this case of the axons was quite small. And so the removal was similarly very small. Uh, the permit limit here is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 8 micrograms per liter, a very challenging uh, limit, as you can see. These are other culvert modifications that also showed for dioxins minimal reduction. They did better on, on some of the others, but most of these were significantly undersized compared to the drainage area, compared to these middle guys here, the, the, the large-scale devices, more engineered uh, facilities. And here are our laboratory test results here. So we had no statistically significant difference in our effluent conditions, you know, for the well-operated field conditions versus our laboratory conditions for similar influent conditions. We also looked at long-term performance, and we looked at this in a number of ways. We were ad addressing and calculating the accumulation of solids you know, on this, uh, on the devices, you know, uh, with time to see uh, when they may clog. And uh, we also looked at trends with time associated with the influent and effluent concentrations, uh, the particulate strengths, particulate strengths, as you would know, would simply be looking at the particulate forms of the pollutants. You know, we would take a an unfiltered sample and a filtered sample, subtracting the two, we would get a particular bound concentration. That's divided through by the particular concentration in milligrams per liter. So we end up with a milligrams per kilogram particular strength value and we've used this quite a bit to identify potential sources and also uh, what forms of the pollutants are, are being captured by the, by the different devices. So we also uh, were concerned about, of course, the clogging versus the chemical breakthrough. And so um, when we looked at long-term trends, we actually had decreasing concentrations of the influent going into a lot of our control practices associated with a lot of the other ancillary controls that were being done on the site, a lot of the erosion control, as I mentioned, a lot of vegetation, in addition to uh, interim so removal activity as we wait for the DTSC to come up with the final uh, cleanup plan for the soils on the site, but they had a preliminary uh, cleanup activity that were possible to do. So when we looked at the constituents that did not have an influent trend and focused on the effluent concentrations with time, we, we did not see any statistically valid trends in, in concentrations over the six to nine year period of time. The same thing with the influent and effluent particulate strengths you know, those also uh, reflected continuous uh, basic uh, level of performance. You know, so we also had clogging occur, especially at our undersized culvert modification locations, CM1, 
as an example, the first one that was put in was quite undersized, you know, and it it uh, showed signs of clogging after several years. That was then rebuilt uh, as ex as expected based upon our analyses and from our laboratory results. CM9 is approaching uh, when that needs to be done, and so uh, this year and next year that is going to be rebuilt. Most of the other facilities had a more extensive pretreatment and, and a larger footprint. And so the demand on the media surface itself was a lot less and they, and they likely would not need uh, removal of the media during the life of the project, which would probably be another five years or so. So our conclusions based upon this information is that our well-established distributed controls can have measurable benefits at the outfalls, especially during the small in intermediate storms, but as the storm size increases, our benefits will decrease. In this situation, as I mentioned, we did see trends. We were able to significantly reduce the number of exceedances at the outfalls with time, not only with the uh, media controls that we developed, but also a lot of other ancillary activities on the site that also reduced the amount of transport of this material. The, the main thing is that we have to treat a large fraction of the watershed. Uh, I showed you our process for identifying the so-called hotspots, the most critical locations, and we certainly need to go through and develop control practices for those, but those generally correspond to a relatively small fraction of the total flow and probably the total mass of pollutants from the whole site. So we generally have to address much of the site in order to have a significant benefit at the outfall. So again, uh, we have to have a, a lot of data in order to be able to evaluate this. I mentioned we had tens of thousands of data points during this project to be able to identify what was occurring. So our, our laboratory tests were successful in predicting our, our large scale field performance are based on influent concentra effluent concentrations and the, and the sediment loading. And then this is for a variety of different biofilter scenarios, you know, horizontal vertical flow with and without vegetation, with and without substantial pretreatment. And we also, some of these had outlet controls also for controlling the flow rates. So one of the important features was, you know, how to develop, how to do a, a, a monitoring of, it, of, of, of these types of locations. And our significant problem here is, is we have to use real stormwater, you know, a simulated stormwater that has been used in the past in some situations. It's not re very reflective on what likely will occur, you know, at the actual site. We have <clears throat> a large amount of competing major ions that will uh, affect the capacity of the site. We have organic complexes that can cause fouling. We have bacterial conditions that can also uh, address biofouling issues. You know, but uh, mainly we have a wide range of particle sizes from clays to silt types of materials in addition to fine sand. So using real stormwater that's subjected to our test conditions under flow rates, inner event times and durations that mimic our actual site design conditions is, is pretty important. And again, as I mentioned, we have to have a lot of data in order to have significant statistically rigorous results. And we also need to run these long enough to actually have failure in the laboratory in order to uh, be able to project that. Quickly, I'm, I know I'm running out of time here <laughs> in the sense of 15 minutes or so, but we looked at um, other tests and projects to look at scaling of small scale results, to large scale tests. Uh, Leila Talibi, uh, during her PhD dissertation, working with us, uh, published a, a great dissertation shown here. You can just go to my research website and you can find it pretty easily if you know to type all that in. But she was able to put together three of the projects that we were involved with on data analysis. One in Melbourne, New Jersey, small scale uh, dry well tests that were done to look at a volume reduction and also hopefully pollutant characteristics too. In Kansas City, we're involved in both <clears throat> in the data analyses for this. We're looking at both the small scale tests in addition to large scale outfall. So we had the comparisons between that. And also in Cincinnati, we're involved in data analysis for a, 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 a number of outfall monitoring associated with green infrastructure and looking at 
at the benefits associated with what do we actually see. <clears throat> so this is um, a, a quick plot, you know, of what we were doing in New Jersey, where they were required to put in infiltration devices with these dry wells to compensate for increased amounts of runoff associated with increased uh, building on the site and increased impervious areas due to remodeling or expansions of the homes and businesses. And we looked at you know, quite a few of these in, in the community itself, and most of them were working as intended. But about a third of them had problems with the groundwater, which was not expected. The groundwater was a lot higher than the city had anticipated. And uh, some of them were in saturated groundwater conditions all the time. The picture on the left here shows one where we had dry conditions initially. <coughs> Excuse me. Our, uh, <clears throat> our initial tests here of infiltration were done with, with uh, domestic water to be able to uh, measure the infiltration rates at a controlled time. But then we had our instruments in these uh, locations for so a year or more. And we were able to look during the wet weather period of time. So we can see a buildup of the groundwater mounding underneath these sites and a significant decrease you know, in the drainage time from these things. We also monitored and or collected uh, water uh, within the dry well and also several feet below the dry well in the surrounding soil area. And statistically, we did not see any <clears throat> uh, change in the water quality constituents. The other project, the large scale project that I mentioned in, in Kansas City is an EPA demonstration project for green infrastructure. We were focusing on about a hundred acre pilot study area that had about a hundred stormwater controls in the right of ways as you can see along the roads because their consent decree for the CSO control objective here required that the city maintain these. And so they had to have access to them. That created some problems uh, when the locations for these controls were established. They were they were put in to maximize the runoff capture from the area, but in these in these uh, light light uh, teal areas were not captured by these stormwater controls because they were on private property. Mainly, we had a lot of uh, yard drains and backyards, as an example, due to local flooding problems. And the city came through over the years and put in yard drains, but that's on private property, and so. Uh, the stormwater controls could not be located there because of access limitations. We also had problems, driveways in the wrong location or, or legacy trees that didn't want or shouldn't be removed, you know, were also in the way. So it ended up that even with, you know, with re uh, retrofitting in a mature area, only about half of the runoff was able to be directed to the stormwater controls before it went into the combined sewer system. Again, these are examples of the 100 or so controls that were established in this area. Some of our monitoring results here, we had an initial baseline condition for several years. They relined the sewer to prevent uh, groundwater from getting into it, but unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but they, what happened was the opposite. They found that the, uh, the combined sewage was actually leaking out of the pipes and it relined that it actually increased the baseline conditions. After construction, we saw you know, about a 50% reduction, you know, corresponding to the amount of area that was being captured, you know, by these control practices. Another series of projects I mentioned were in, in Cincinnati, where they have a number of different uh, demonstration projects throughout the community. We looked at a handful of these, looking at the outfall characteristics from these. This is from a technical college who's up on a hill, and so the water is draining in these different sub areas. This Example here is for this segment located in here. We have uh, some buildings and, and pavement that was draining down this hillside towards this main uh, uh, little, you know, big biofilter area, big rain garden area. And there are porous pavements, you know, associated on the top here and on the hillside coming down. They had these, these living walls, they're basically terraces for slowing the water down and allowed to infiltrate. So again, our, our data shows our volumetric runoff coefficient plots, you know, before construction, during the construction period itself, but after construction, again, we're in this situation, we're capturing almost all of the water coming down. So we had about, about a 75% reduction in the runoff volume under a wide range of storms. And as I mentioned earlier, we get obviously complete infiltration for the smaller and intermediate storms. 
And as the storm sizes increase, you know, obviously we're capturing smaller and smaller fractions of those. So our benefits can be extrapolated to large drainage areas, you know, but we have to deal with the mass balance of these areas. And we also have to understand the pollutant sources. We have to look at transport problem sources and sinks. And so we <clears throat> also find that it's difficult to retrofit with a, a large capture of the area, which is pretty important. And we also know that groundwater characteristics and disturbed urban soils, the compaction that occurs with construction, all influence these performances. The groundwater problems, uh, uh, Shirley Clark and I have uh, recently put together two ebooks uh, for the groundwater project at a uh, University of Guelph in, Can in uh, Ottawa, or I'm sorry, not in Ottawa, in Canada. You know, in, uh, and in that situation, we uh, identified in these ebooks one on quality and one on quantity issues on, on groundwater in urban situations. Those are uh, in production still, so hopefully they'll be available fairly soon. The groundwater project is a great resource with an awful lot of information on, on groundwater issues uh, that you can think of, and that's all freely available, a good teaching resource. So we were lucky enough to be asked to uh, prepare these two for urban, urban conditions. So uh, finishing up here, uh, looking at what we've been doing with WindSlam with a all of this information that we've been gathering. We have a lot of, of controls, uh, green infrastructure types of controls that are built into WindSlam, you know, bioretention and bioinfiltration areas, rain gardens, porous pavements, grass wells, grass filters, uh, basins and trenches, even simple disconnections. Other things that we incorporate in the model that we can evaluate include evapotranspiration, uh, to canopy interception of trees, the effects of the compacted soils and also beneficial uses of the stormwater for uh, irrigation, toilet flushing or whatever. So we're, we continuously update the model to incorporate data during laboratory studies as confirmed by field monitoring. And so the ones that were uh, the, the work that we're currently involved with is upgrading the, the biofilter components based upon this information that we've been collecting for a number of years but we're looking at flow rate equations based on media type, organic content, texture, compaction, uniformity. Uh, we have regression equations for uh, particle trapping by different particle sizes and clogging flow rate reductions associated with that. We're looking at uh, filterable and particulate pollutant retention, of course, and also how that may be affected by contact time or residence time in, in the devices themselves and also breakthrough uh, associated with that. So uh, I have a, a lot of data that we evaluated and analyzed that are summarized in a preliminary white paper. We're making changes to it as we go into modeling. So we, uh, this enables us to, to uh, compare different designs and different attributes associated you know, with potential uh, designs for uh, biofiltration controls. This is a schematic of our of our biofilter scheme that we have in the model itself. We have multiple compartments associated you know, with the surface cell on the top of ponding water. Then we have a layer of engineered media. We, and then we have you know, a, a, uh, a void material you know, uh, and potentially tile drain material. And then of course, the natural surrounding soil areas. And so we look at the transfer of pollutants and water between these different areas, the backup, the retention, the clogging, that will occur with time, you know, during this, these mass balances. And so we also have maintenance intervals and pretreatment benefits that we can incorporate, you know, into our analyses. This is a field screen, input screen that we have in the model itself in the upper left-hand corner here. We basically size the hull. And, and as we put the data in, it gets drawn down here. Uh, we also look at the soil characteristics, we can select them or enter in our data directly. And then we have a, a submenu here on the media data, which is on the next slide I'll show you, which we put in our mixture of materials and that calculates the, the physical and chemical characteristics associated with that. Then we uh, have uh, options for entering in the, the, the hydraulic controls on the device from, from the surface standpipes or under drain materials. Then we have, uh, you know, uh, evapotranspiration that would be associated with the type of plant 
and the you know the percent cover of the plant in the biofilter, which again is associated with a the root depth and the ET adjustment factor as an example. You know, then we also can do evaporation across the pond in water. So again, uh, we're able to do a continuous mass balance, uh, you know, the water through these systems, the particulate forms of the pollutants, and also the soluble forms of the pollutants. So this is the uh, memo, uh, memo, <laughs> the menu <laughs> associated <clears throat> with it, uh, the selection of the contaminants. It's just a, a, it's truncated so that it, it's extensive uh, to the top here. That's not shown. Where we have soil categories uh, that we can select, reselect a fraction of each uh, of these materials. We have other media. We have sands, chemical active amendments. We have some user-defined amendments, and also uh, media mixtures. The media mixtures are predefined, so you don't select a fraction of those. You select the whole thing, as an example, and some predefined uh, media mixtures too from from actual uh, studies that have been conducted. So from when we do the analysis, uh, we have our data presented in a number of different ways. In this example here, uh, just what it's basically a single row associated with different attributes associated with performance of, of this one device. We'll have <clears throat> different rows associated with uh, different biofilters and different types of controls that we may have you know, in our area. But basically we're looking at the influent characteristics coming into the device and then effluent attributes associated with that from a mass balance standpoint, we know where the water uh, and the particulates are going and the pollutants. If we had overflows exceeding the capacity, we have maximum stage, uh, evaporation process, uh, discharge bypass, uh, excessive ponding that may occur, the residence time in the media and the, and the actual number of runoff events compared to the, the total number. So this is just a quick summary of what's going on, we have calculation step data, you know, which occurs every several minutes for potentially, you know, years of uh, rainfall data. So from that information, we're looking at an annual performance or total study period performance. We can look at production functions. This is an example production function for an example design. Obviously, it will vary for different designs and locations. But in this situation, if we had a biofilter that was about 3% of the paved area footprint, you know, we are getting in this example about 50% uh, runoff line reduction and about an 85% particulate reduction. And again, we can see what the benefits would be about enlarging the size of that or decreasing it. And of course, we can go through other basic design changes to that. One of the other features with the model output is we can calculate clogging conditions and premature failure that may occur. We generally see that we want to have about two and a half kilometers per square meter per year, you know, uh, <clears throat> deposition into the device, you know, or less. And that's assuming that we have a healthy plant activity. And, uh, and if we, we find that if we have more than that, we're, you know, we're basically it's, it's 25 kilograms per square meter, but we want that to occur over at least 10 year, years of time. So that's what this number came from. You know, and this example, uh, that corresponds to about a two and a half percent of the paved area. So if our biofilter in this example was smaller than that, we're likely to have premature clogging. If we're greater than that, the plants are able to find, we find that the plants are able to incorporate the material into the biofilter, into the biofilter media. Uh, these are generally designed as depth filters. We're not just looking at the surface, you know, for with the plant activity that enables the water and other material to go on, on through the material itself. So again, this is just one example. This is not, of course, going to be the case for all situations. And finally, a couple of examples of use in Wisconsin DOT production functions that were developed for them based upon, you know, their typical media, their typical designs for biofilters and looking at the size of those biofilters source areas as a function of different soils and, and, and as a function of different amounts of surface storage. So again, it was just based upon a specific design uh, characteristic, but changing the soils and the volume of, of surface ponding. And we can see that increased surface ponding in this situation substantially increased the amount of retention of, of particulate solids. So these are the types of things that we typically do with the model, with the uh, long-term analyses, 
and evaluating biofilters at different sizes for an area and of course for, for different designs. So in conclusion, you know, uh, we see that our biofilters, uh, the, the pollutant filtered retention can be targeted by a proper selection of the media itself. The, the media selection also dramatically affects the treatment flow rate of the biofilter. But we also know that find that most of the pollutant removal occurs through infiltration in the underlying native soils. We do have pretreatment in our media, but if we have an underdrain, you know, we basically can short circuit a lot of that infiltration potential. And so we want to be very careful when we when we use that. That's why we're considering, you know, the mass balances of of surface ponding versus the infiltration rates and, and uh, going down into the native surface conditions. So again, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of decisions obviously that have to be considered in, in the design of these types of devices. Finally, obviously the, I was able to only present very small amounts of the material from these different projects. You know, my research website has extensive information associated with these and specifically the dissertations and theses with a large number of students that have worked with me on these different types of projects with media. <clears throat> and of course, a number of different clients, you know, that have supported our work. And certainly uh, colleagues at like Penn State, you know, Shirley Clark and uh, Deb O'Bannon at University of Missouri, Kansas City, who have assisted on a number of these projects. And of course, my colleagues, you know, with Winslam, uh, John Voorhees, uh, Caroline Berger and Doug Yoakum have are also acknowledged too, certainly. So again, I guess I'll leave it at that. And I guess hopefully we can get into some answers to your questions or questions to your answers, <laughs> probably more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. That was a very interesting and uh, presentation. We have a number of questions, but I'm gonna ask mine first. It's a burning <laughs> question at least in my mind. Uh, it regards the California study where you had all these, a uh, huge number of uh, filtration, bio, uh, filtration devices put in and a number of biofiltration devices, I believe. Um, and it has been found, um, we have found that, uh, other investigators have found that plants uh, restrict clogging. So plants actually keep the pores open so that you don't have clogging. And did you find that in the California study or were they clogged pretty much at the rate that you expected? They clogged pretty much at the rate that we expected. The California location was a very arid location. And, as, and what this, the plants were selected based upon a native palate. That was the first thing. But they also had to be able to survive months without any rain and then days of being submerged. You know, so we went through greenhouse experiments to be able to uh, narrow down the native palette of plants that would survive under those conditions. But yes, you're right. And that's why I mentioned on that clogging plot, you know, uh, the two and a half kilograms of square meter per year, that assumes a healthy plant environment. As I mentioned that the plants are very critical in most situations to be able to break up the material that's, that's accumulating to be able to get the material down into the filter itself instead of just clogging on the surface much more rapidly. But the type of material that we're using, the much more porous material, we generally didn't see that much of a problem, but I still by far would recommend plants. Some of our systems could not have plants in them, you know, and, and they also functioned in a similar way. But there are a lot of benefits. One of the, one of the objectives on this site was dealing with a group called the pollinators. You know, we're dealing with bees and butterflies and so you know so there's and we and we actually have cougars on this site <clears throat> so there's a lot of wildlife issues and insect issues that were that were pretty impor important to be considered in addition to the um the the you know the aesthetics and, and other features themselves so again i agree you know the plants are important and in all in most situations don't incorporate that but you also need to consider long periods of dry conditions out west. And what are you going to do? You're going to have to keep those plants healthy. You're going to have to irrigate them just like on a green roof. You know, a, you know, again, people, I haven't done much research myself on green roofs, many people have, but again, I would expect that you would want to 
not killed everything <laughs> due to due to lack of moisture. So that's another opportunity for for reuse of captured water. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, John Voorhees asked this question: For the biofilters that had sedimentation, were the loading rates below the clogging rate? If not, how was maintenance performed on the devices? Yeah. Uh, hi, John. He can't answer a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whatever. The uh, the we were able to we were looking at 20 to 50 kilograms a square meter as an absolute uh, clogging value, and and when we were getting surface ponding on those sites, and these did not have vegetation on them. When we got the surface ponding on the sites, you know, our, we, we calculated the sediment load of being in that range. You know, so uh, we had to remove the media. We had to rebuild the media because again, we're dealing with, with uh, capture at depth. This is not a simple scraping of the surface. We have done that during many tests. We find that simple scraping of the surface for our designs that I use and the media that I work, work with, you know, helps a little bit for a little while. After about three times, and they get more, you know, they have to be closer and closer together and finally it doesn't work anymore. So basically we want to utilize the whole depth of that material. We want to try to balance pollutant retention and clogging issues. Basically the media is spent. You know, that is then boxed up, it gets analyzed to determine where it needs to be disposed of, and then we have to replace it. You know, again, these were under designed, you know, that were that were doing that. We expected that to occur for the facilities that were more oversized, especially with plants in, we don't expect those will need to be, have media replacement occurring during the life of those projects. Again, the life of the project here is defined when we finally do full site restoration, you know, uh, based upon uh, the state of California's requirements for that. And then hopefully we'll be back into natural conditions. You know, so we're looking, we thought initially it was gonna be like 10 years. It's been going on more than 10 years now, and hopefully we'll have site uh, conditions established uh, better within the next few years. But again, it was, they failed as predicted and we had to replace the media, and that, which is what we had intended. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Gary Oberts has a question. <clears throat> He's talking about uh, the California studies. In such a dry climate, how did you gather enough real stormwater to conduct adequate lab tests? The lab tests were done in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, and in Alabama, <laughs> you know, because that's where our laboratory facilities were located. Uh, we were looking at concentrations of our influent water that was similar to what we were looking at on the site. You know, uh, more importantly, I guess, during the, we, we would capture the water and hold it for an extended period of time, you know, probably for several weeks to several months, and then work that in the columns. So I mentioned that we have to consider, you know, the storage aspects associated with that. For the heavy metals, that is not an issue. For the dioxins, it's not an issue that we were looking at. We were not looking at nutrients. We were not looking at bacteria in, in these studies. We would have to have a different design for these than what we conducted at that uh, situation. So we recaptured, um, you know, tens of thousands of liters of stormwater, you know, on the sites and then use that over a period of maybe a month or so. And then we replaced that over and we ran that for maybe a year or so. In California, when we do this, it's the same thing. You know, we have to capture the water and lead it in. We don't do it on a real-time basis with storm because of that problem. So, um, so you you did write a paper on the MPDES database and how it relates to stormwater uh, concentrations. Is I'm wondering, is Alabama and uh, Pittsburgh? Uh, is that stormwater very similar to that stormwater in California? Well, we, we knew what it was. You know, we, we had our, our characteristics. I showed you the plot or influent concentrations in that example for the axons. You know, uh, we're similar. You know, uh, the metals, you know, uh, we're within our range. You know, certainly it, it has, there's, there is a lot of variability for sure. You know, um, and that's why we did pilot, we did the laboratory tests and then we did the, the culvert mods and then we built up and we had data ongoing to verify 
you know, our, uh, the ability of our laboratory tests to uh, correspond to what we're seeing in the field. So, so what you're saying uh, is that the variability at each site is probably greater than the variability between Alabama and California. Yeah. Yeah, in that situation, uh, and it has to do with the, the area that we were collecting our water, water from also. Okay, so here's a, a question from Mike Trojan. He um, works on the uh, Minnesota uh, Stormwater Manual. It says the ground, he says the groundwater quality ebook sounds very interesting. I have found it challenging to find good info on hydrologic impacts of increased stormwater infiltration. Could you provide a quick summary of what you are finding regarding quantity issues? Are groundwater levels rising under infiltration? Is urban stream base flow increasing? Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, there's, there's scattered data throughout. Much of our information is from up in your neck of the woods are dealing with, you know, increasing salt content, you know, but we also have increasing groundwater tables in some situations, but also decreasing if we're withdrawing, you know, for domestic water supplies. And so it's very complex to see that. Again, the people at the University of Maryland, uh, Alan Davis will be on in a bit, and he can might describe some of the work that's being done there, looking at, at subsurface and, and uh, surface interactions uh, of those flows in an urban setting. But yeah, that's, that's all critical. And in our eBooks, we, we try to separate them into quantity and quality. You know, issues, uh, we're basically looking at micro versus macro. You know, on the micro scale basis, yeah, we all know that we have mounding of groundwater underneath infiltration devices. You know, uh, on a macro scale, if we have an awful lot of these, there's an interesting paper that was uh, done in Pittsburgh itself, actually looking at the tremendous amounts of infiltration devices they're going to put in in that area. And they, they were seeing some significant, they were predicting some significant increases in the water table, you know, that, that would potentially cause some problems in basements and, and drainage issues. Yeah, so that was the largest scale uh, paper that I've seen associated with that. Quality wise, you know, again, I mentioned the salts is pretty obvious for you guys, you know, but also we had other uh, issues in, in, in the books that I mentioned, you know, that you mentioned, <laughs> that you, you have in other papers that we've written, you know, uh, summarizing these, you know, we do see uh, a number of, especially pesticides are designed to be mobile in the environment. You know, heavy metals are, they, you know, don't move that well. Uh, PAHs don't move that well. Some of them do, the more volatile components may. So it's a, it's a, it's a large range of conditions. <clears throat> Has a lot to do with the texture of the soil itself also. So yeah, it's, it's all over the place. But the main thing is, where is your groundwater? You know, the cities that we worked in didn't have a clue, which is bizarre because their people are digging holes all the time. You know, they're, they're building trenches, they're doing basements. You know, they should know if they have shallow groundwater. You know, so the, the stormwater people group will go and say, oh yeah, our groundwater is 30 feet deep. Well, it's not, it's five. <laughs> you know, they should know that. You know, and, and the groundwater elevation is one of the least expensive monitoring things that you can do, you know, with, with simple observation wells and simple level recorders. You know, so that should be done before any type of large scale infiltration is planned for an area. Okay, thank you, Bob. We'll, uh, that concludes this presentation. We, we will take a five minute break and we'll come back. Andy Erickson will come back with the panel and we'll have a very interesting panel discussion. Uh, Keith Pilgrim, Alan Davis, uh, Mike Eisensee, and Andy Erickson will be on the panel with Bob Pitt. So we'll see you in five minutes at five minutes after the hour. Thank you. Welcome back everyone to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. My name is Andy Erickson and it is my privilege to moderate the panel discussion. We have a great local panel uh, and mix of experts. And it's my honor to introduce them now uh, as they've graciously agreed to serve on this panel. So we have uh, two local experts and we have a special guest uh, panelist as well uh, to join Bob Pitt on this panel discussion. 
The first panelist is Keith Pilgrim. And Keith is a senior water resources specialist at Bar Engineering Company. So Keith, if you are with us, uh, can you please turn on your webcam and unmute your mic and tell us from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Uh, I, I think I relate mostly um, thinking about the, you know Bob's focus on the media and trying to uh, design systems that enhance removal beyond what has traditionally been done. A lot of his, his discussion, I was nodding along thinking, yes, I've seen that as well. You know, his ideas of site characterization, longevity, the effects of uh, clogging versus media longevity, things like that. So uh, many of the, the topics that Bob brought up uh, resonate with me uh, very directly in the work that I do. That's great. Thanks, Keith. Our next panelist is Mike Eisensee, and Mike actually is a returning panelist to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series, and he's the administrator for the Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District. So Mike, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic today? Uh, hi, Andy. Uh, thanks for every, to everyone on the panel today and Bob for that excellent presentation. Uh, like most practitioners, um, I'm the end user of decades of research computations uh, that have been then combined into modeling. Uh, at, the, at the local level for lake and stream restoration and protection, um, we really have three tools available to us. Uh, our regulatory tools, our capital improvement projects, and then working with uh, private landowners for voluntary retrofitting. And in each one of those uh, pollutant, you know, the, the research under around pollutant characteristics, uh, transport, removal mechanisms are really important for us to have predictive uh, results uh, that will actually help us meet our goals at the local level for protecting and restoring those streams and lakes. Um, so we're all standing on shoulders of giants, and I'm very honored to be uh, on a panel of so many of those today. Thank you. That's great, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike, your uh, microphone is a little bit quiet, so I don't know if you can check on that while we go to our next panelist. Our next panelist is a special guest panelist. Uh, when we were preparing for this topic and this discussion, uh, this person for John and I both just kind of jumped at the forefront of our minds that we had to have Dr. Alan Davis on this panel because of his years of experience. And Dr. Davis is actually also a former Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series keynote speaker. Uh, if you wanna see his presentation, it is on our YouTube channel. And Dr. Davis is the Charles A. Irish Senior Chair in Civil Engineering, a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and an affiliate professor in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at the University of Maryland. So Dr. Davis, we're so thankful that you're here to join us today. From your perspective and experience, how do you relate to this topic for anybody that might not know that already? Sure, thanks, Andy. And you know, <clears throat> thanks, Bob, for the, the presentation. It was absolutely great. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the things that Bob is doing, we've been doing some very similar type uh, things. Um, my research group's very interested in media and how the media impacts uh, stormwater as we push it through the media. Um, we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and a lot of our work is driven by Chesapeake Bay issues and, and that's nitrogen and phosphorus. So a bit of a different focus than the toxics that Bob is doing, but uh, doing some of uh, many of the same things, but, uh, but with a different pollutant uh, palette that we're looking at. That's great, Dr. Davis. We're so thankful that you're here. We're so thankful that, I, that Keith and Mike are on this panel as well. I will not ask for Bob's relation to the topic. He gave us the keynote and set the stage for this discussion. So thank you for that, Bob. I'm going to jump into some questions uh, for our audience members. Uh, please continue to post your questions in the Q&A chat for our panel. Continue to upvote those, give them the thumbs up so they rise to the top. I'm gonna to be taking a mix of, of questions that I have and then questions that come in from our audience. So please post those questions. But I wanna start this discussion uh, with kind of a big picture question. And Dr. Davis, Dr. Pitt, uh, myself, others have done a number of laboratory studies and even our panelists have seen 
field work and field monitoring studies on biofilters and other stormwater control measures. And what I wanna ask is, is from our collective experience, what has been the biggest challenge in taking lab data under very controlled conditions or even field measurements, whether that's monitoring or field testing, how do we translate that to the actual expected or predicted performance? What are the challenges when we try to do that for our stormwater control measures and biofilters specifically? So anybody can chime in on the panel. Uh, just give us your responses. Well, I'll, I'll say a few comments. You know, one of the things that Rhea found, we've, we've looked at different size laboratory tests. You know, the pilot scale test, you know, going from as small as two inch columns up to columns that were, you know, several feet across, you know, and so there's a scaling issue there. We're dealing with, with the granularity of the material, we have edge wall effects, we have uh, particular trapping, you know, so we, we, we have to kind of scale it carefully and at multiple steps before jumping in from a two inch column to a device that's several hundred square feet. You know, that's not a direct one-to-one, -one. you know, so that's what, that's what we did during our experiments usually, as I say, we do small scale, intermediate scale, and then we verify it in the, in the field itself. So there are some issues and, and there are some theoretical approaches that can be taken, but you still need to verify and confirm that. Yeah, those are great words of wisdom. Yeah, the other issue, of course, as pointed out before in questions is the quality of your water and that you have to use stormwater. You, you might be able to jack it up, you know, but it's important to have the fines in there, the organics in there, the major ions in there that are gonna interfere with that. You know, if you need to increase a, a metal concentration fine, you know, a, a, a small amount, but you, you be careful about the acidity of your total mixture and issues like that. But you got to use stormwater, not just a straight, pure tap water with some silica in it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've, we had that discussion in previous presentations. But again, I think that would be the other issue that I would present. Other channels are challenging. Um, this is Keith Pilgrim. I, I think one of the big challenges we do these studies um, in the laboratory in a steady state condition with controlled temperatures and conditions and I think climate and seasonal variability is something we often don't think about in particular when we're pushing the boundaries from physical type of removal to systems that require chemistry to behave properly for the performance that we expect and I think that uh, you know things like temperature um, we often don't think about biological oxygen demand you know I'm continually surprised by the amount of biological oxygen demand that's even coming off of impervious surfaces. And all those things come together to affect pH. And so now that we're using more media, um, I think the climate can have a very large impact. You know, the spring being high oxygen, summer being low in the fall, and the corresponding effects with pH and temperature. So I think that is something that we often don't uh, consider. Yeah, the water chemistry, the temperature, very, very important for these systems. And, and even, especially if you're thinking biological systems too, right? Uh, you gotta keep that also in mind. Other comments? Yeah, I would just tack on to all of this. To me, it, it's really the variability of everything. Um, media variability from place to place. I mean, hydrologists have been looking for years to deal with design storms and return periods and how all of that's changing. And that's just the hydrology side of things. Then you bring in the variability of the water chemistry and the biology, even at a single site is difficult. So how do you begin to mimic that in a controlled lab setting? I mean, it's, it's next to impossible to do. So somehow we have to make concessions and then begin to think about how this scales up. So to me, just dealing with this in a reasonable manner is, is always going to be a challenge. Yeah, I really resonate with the, uh, the variability component on the ground. Uh, I think of uh, a, a number of scenarios where we have crushed limestone in the watershed for a hot spot uh, that dramatically increases the fines in our stormwater flows that we weren't anticipating. Um, auto repair junkyards, uh, heavy equipment yards, et cetera, which have higher concentrations of metals and uh, potential hotspots for uh, especially petroleum-based products. Um, 
But then I would add to that too, I think the practically from the on the ground piece is that we have this great research on these medias and their performance, but then we're challenged with uh, consistently replicating those uh, in the field through the construction process uh, and through trying to get lab tests as part of a, a part of a development process prior to these mixtures going in and then uh, coming up with field testing methodology to ensure that they're installed properly, uh, that the material that we needed was uh, was actually installed um, and that they're they're functioning within parameters. I think that's a great point, Mike, that how do we how do we ensure that what was tested in the lab or even in the small scale or even in pilot scale in terms of the media is actually what gets installed in a practice that's maybe not in the same location, right? How do we make sure that our specifications and our construction documents translate that information that was found in research to actual practice? Um, and that's certainly a challenge. That's certainly a challenge, but there is there's a strong need for that. And I, you know, the other thing I want to I want to reiterate because I, I feel like the 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 point is very important. You know, we can do small scale lab studies. We can even do relatively large scale laboratory studies. But I think the value of those intermediate steps getting to pilot scale, getting in the field, um, whether it's small scale or large scale, but uh, doing small scale pilot studies in the field with actual stormwater under natural environment conditions really give you a lot of information and lessons learned that often you can't replicate in a field or in a uh, laboratory type situation. It can be just very challenging. Uh, so I think those are all great points. Again, audience, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. We have a couple stragglers from the uh, from Bob's presentation, which I may uh, pull into this. Uh, but I do wanna ask kind of a, a, a follow on question to this uh, discussion. And so, so let's let's assume for a moment that we have uh, lab studies, pilot scale studies, we have some information, we, we build a full scale, uh, and then we take maybe performance data from our full scale field installations. How can we then translate that? Or maybe how have you translated for our practitioners here on the panel? How have you translated some of that data from other locations and what you expect to see in your locations or your installations? Do you add a factor of safety to that? How do you consider maintenance? How do you think about the resiliency? Or do you, or you do you just say, you know what, we're gonna try this. If it works, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. This is just to see if it works. So I want you to comment on that. And also, you know, when you're talking to clients, uh, if you're a consultant, how do you convey that message to clients uh, when you wanna try some of these new and innovative things? Well, I think it's it's critical that for any area before you propose, before you build a multi-gazillion dollar practice that you better have some pilot studies out there. You better check and make sure it works. You gotta convince the stakeholders. You gotta convince the regulators that this approach is gonna function. You know, it, it, we can have all the math, we can have all the chemistry, and we have a lot of good reasons to believe that, but I think we need to take that first step you know, and and do some pilot scale neighborhoods or test areas before we spend a tremendous amounts of money to commit ourselves to the larger scale. That's that's what I have seen to be issues that need to be addressed. Other comments or responses? Yeah, I from the from the practitioner's side, especially in the regulatory programs, I, I agree with Bob's comments. Uh, we wanna see, when we talk about innovative practices, but we wanna see uh, practices that have been built upon uh, research uh, or pilot scale studies already. They, there can certainly be innovative adaptations of known performance. Um, those are much easier to permit, uh, but, uh, but there are so many variables in the field uh, when it comes to the, the performance that we really prefer those to be rooted, uh, those innovations to be rooted in actual uh, research and field scale uh, projects. I'd add on to your Andy, your, your comment earlier, but I think site characterization is really important and not just um, a couple samples, you know, in the whole annual kind of cycle. And knowing uh, the failure point of whatever BMP or device you're using and how that may correspond to that site characterization. 
I think is, is quite important. And then designing your system such that you do try to get around whatever the limitations may be of that particular site. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I had, I had a professor in my undergraduate that said, as engineers, we're designing for failure, right? We're choosing what is that failure point. And for these systems, whether that's a hydrology, right? Is it a storm size, a recurrence period for water quality? Is it a life capacity, right? Absorption capacity, if it's chemical, uh, or is it a limitation based on biological processes? So what, at what point will it fail? That's, that's what we get as engineers and designers. We get to choose that, right? But we also have to balance that with what's something that's feasible to build and construct and, and site constraints. Uh, any other comments on that, uh, that aspect? So I wanna jump into, this actually leads really well into a question that we had that came in actually during Bob's presentation towards the end of it. Uh, and it, re it relates to uh, rainfall data, precipitation changes over time, climate change, thinking about resiliency and, and systems. How do we consider that piece of the variability? So we already talked about there's variability in hydrology based on location, water quality based on location, but we also seem to be having a moving design target <laughs> when we talk about climate change and even to a certain extent water quality. We find new pollutants in our runoff almost every time we test for them, right? We have all these contaminants yep. of emerging concern coming through. So now, again, thinking of pilot scales, we talked about pilot scales and the importance of pilot scales, giving us some information on that, but we also have to think about the future. How do we take this practice this concept of designing these types of practices into the future and what other things should we consider how do we do that well uh, where are we at what's the state of the science and what do you think the future could be as we think about resiliency and moving into climate change and pre precipitation yeah. patterns I, I think that there are practices that are let's say fragile and versus more robust you know a big pond is pretty damn robust as an example, where a small inlet filter could be pretty fragile, you know, as an example. So again, I think we need a mixture of these things within our watershed. We need to anticipate what the future design conditions like might be. We have plenty of climate change models that we can work from. Uh, many of the stormwater models, not Winslam, unfortunately, but some of the others have components in there that kind of incorporate adjustments to the Uran series to consider what may happen in the future. And that's mainly for the hydraulics, of course, for the situation, but we're designing for hydraulics, of course, and, and these smaller devices too. And so we change our, the probability of capture, our treatment flow rates, we basically, you know, it's the same thing with snow melt. You know, we, we don't design for snow melt. Again, people have up in your neck of the woods, we make things two to three times larger, maybe, you know, than, than what we would think of. Otherwise, we have temperature problems, let alone the, the changes in water chemistry. So we have to approach, I think, the same thing with other devices, maybe not two to three times as much, but, it, you know, we're just going to lose, you know, the higher flow rates and more frequently, you know, so if we want to capture those, you know, we can, but in most cases, we're only dealing with this small and intermediate storms anyways. We're not capturing, you know, three inches an hour rainstorms in many of our situations. We know that's out of our league, you know, and so we're gonna have more of those, you know, and, and people are blaming green infrastructure because we're not solving their, their flooding problems. You know, we've seen this this last year in many parts around the world that came up in Europe and in China. So again, we have to, we have to realize what our actual goals are and what's reasonable, but we also need to accommodate robustness and change also as much as we can. But we have to anticipate that it's not going to get any better. <laughs> you know, in the West, we had no runoff at Santa Susana last year because it was complete drought conditions. You know, we had some on the site, but nothing at our outfalls. We had no outfall samples you know, for, for the whole year. So, you know, again, climate change is dealing with drought and again, excess of, of rain conditions. So a lot of <clears throat> increasing variability that Al, Alan was describing and others, we, you know, we just are, it's just going to be a, a way of life and it's going to be more and more. We have wildfires. We've had wildfires throughout our site. A major one just a couple of years ago, recovery from wildfires 
is a big, huge issue, you know, for us in, in Southern California, and unfortunately, even further north on the West Coast and in other areas. So we have a lot of these climate-driven problems that we haven't had to deal with before that are dealing with, you know, uh, problems that we're going to have to try to you know, think about. You know, it's not same old, same old approach. Other comments, please. If I can kind of talk on the water quality side, I mean, we're just really at the tip of the iceberg here in, in looking at what's going on. Um, over the last couple of decades, we've learned a lot about some of the more traditional pollutants, you know, nutrients and suspended solids and metals and so forth. But there's hundreds and probably thousands of exotic chemicals that are just starting to be found with research um, at various places. I think some of it at Minnesota looking at various types of organic compounds. We're seeing pharmaceuticals. We're seeing endocrine disruptors. There's starting to be some research on uh, PFAS type chemicals. Uh, basically, if it exists, we're going to find it in stormwater. And we're asking a lot for our stormwater infrastructure to deal with the variable hydrology, the variable water chemistry, um, bacteria and, and, and various types of pathogens. We're asking so much of it and we want it to be simple and maintenance free and cost almost nothing, but yet to do everything for us. So, you know, if anybody thinks that this problem is going to end anytime soon, I would, I would strongly disagree with you. Our challenges, we're just starting to define them. Yeah, that was a, that was a great point, Dr. Davis, and I, I agree uh, fully. And I've always, <clears throat> when I started working in stormwater, uh, I had noted that I would start my career <clears throat> building the basins. And then based on the advancements of uh, technology, especially in the area, I believe of bioremediation, I'll be going back to those basins at the end of my career to retrofit them with media microbial communities and plants that are achieving removals for pretty specific targeted pollutants. Um, as far as climate change, I think that uh, when it comes to filtration, <laughs> uh, so it's a it's a, uh, a a laugh a minute when you've got a cat in the house, isn't it? Okay, so uh, when it when it comes to climate change, I think for filtration media, uh, our our advance or our solution has been really separating our flooding potential from our water quality treatment in the stormwater system. So uh, the big piece, hydrologically speaking, uh, to make that happen is simply bypassing the high flows around our basins instead of through our basins. Um, has proven to solve a lot of the issues that we have with the increasing intensity uh, and depths of our larger storm events. And, and again, we've got, uh, we've got systems for conveyance and storage of those large storm events, but really what we're, what we're focusing on when we're looking at water quality are the smaller events, which luckily uh, currently are fairly stable uh, in Minnesota, uh, as we're as we're changing, um, and so uh, so those have been kind of the least of our concerns as far as climate change. So, I, kind of related to that, then let's think about modeling. Uh, so, if we're thinking about climate change and design, and, and how we have to think about resiliency uh, and precipitation pattern changes. What would you recommend or what have you found to work well so far when you're thinking about modeling and climate change and projecting and design and sizing? So Bob talked about um, snow melt and things like that. Are, are there other things that we should think about in our modeling? And maybe Bob, you can talk about this for Windslam specifically, if there's anything in there inherently built in for precipitation and climate change. Uh, and for the others on the panel, if you've done modeling, what you're considering right now to implement to take account for this uh, climate change precipitation patterns? Mm -hmm. Well, historically, you know, we've, in, in, in water quality modeling, hydraulic modeling, we look at the past. We can look at multiple decades, many decades where the past stuff, as I mentioned, we can look into the future by adjusting the uh, time series, you know, by assuming some type of an increase 
you know, of intense events, uh, increasing drought conditions. You know, we have the climate models ability to do that. I mentioned SWIM has some components in there that enable you to do that. You know, and we hopefully, I know I proposed this many years ago to EPA for wind slam, but I didn't get very far. But hey, John, you're still on the line. You know, put it on your, in our little book, you know, things to do, along with many other things that we want to do. You know, but again, it's it's something that you know, we, we have less uncertainty about the future, whether it's going to get worse, <laughs> you know, in the sense it's going to be more uncertain. We're certain about it's the uncertainty, I guess. You know, so as pointed out. You know, and as you pointed out, you know, the smaller events that we mainly focus on from water quality aren't changing that much, you know, and we have capacity to deal with more of those, but we can't deal with the flow rates associated with the big guys. If we want to, we have to have more storage in our systems, you know, but we're beyond that already, you know, so we can't provide enough storage even for current conditions. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what we're gonna be able to do. The problem, I think the number one problem, and we've seen this, as I mentioned in China, you know, with, with sponge cities, people, people are wading through water three feet deep. You say, our sponge cities failed. Let's get off it, you know? That is an unreasonable expectation, you know? And I, and I, and I see that same thing happening here. We had some massive storms down here two weeks ago. Hadn't had, you know, people saying, well, we lived here for three years now. We've never had it this bad. Duh. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it's going to be bad. You know, it's people have an expectation that the cities are putting in infrastructure that are going to solve the drainage problems. They, they, and especially with they're paying extra money in taxes for, for green infrastructure and water quality issues. They think that's going to solve the problems. And it's not. You know, so people are being sold something that's not likely going to be, you know, you know, realize, and I think that's going to really hurt us in the, in the in the long run if we don't get that message across, irrespective of the modeling. You know, we have different approaches that we have to take there from the community and also from the physical modeling. The physical modeling is easy; dealing with the public is hard, very hard. <laughs> Which I, I don't do that. If I do, I don't do it very well. <laughs> Changing public perception and managing expectations can be a very difficult thing. <laughs> I agree with that. Other comments on that? I'll chime in here again. Um, again, with a little different focus, so more of a water quality focus. Um, you know, we can talk about climate change and wetter or maybe drier or more intense, but there's these ancillary issues. There's the higher temperature and how all of this impacts our system. You know, are we going to look at a different plant palette? Are plants going to grow differently? Uh, you know, these are many cases, biological systems. How are they going to behave? If we have more ponding water, does that mean we go uh, anaerobic more often? So there's all these secondary type issues that are related to what's going to be happening with the performance of our system that I don't think we've really even considered. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Unless there's any other comments on that, I want to I want to pivot a little bit and bring in the idea of maintenance. So Bob brought up maintenance a few times in his presentation. And my question is, OK, so we have all these other variables, right? We build it, we construct it. Let's assume that the pilot studies and all that gave us good data, gave us good in representative information for this particular practice, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a biofilter mix or something else. Let's say we can build it the way that it was studied, right? That we get the right biofilter and the right design in the ground. Well, now over the lifespan, how important is maintenance gonna be, right? And we all know if you don't do maintenance, it's probably not gonna work. Okay, fine. But how does maintenance now factor into all of this? Uh, what are the important maintenance things we should be considering? Are there better ways that we should be maintaining these practices? So what do you have to say about maintenance? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Andy, it's um, it's it's just as important, if not more important, than the design. We talked earlier. Panel members talked about specifications of materials and inspections during construction. That's all extremely critical. And your point here is also extremely critical. And most of the time, it's a traditional: we build it and we, people disappear. You know, and there's there's really no requirement. So on the the only time I've seen this really played out is CSO consent decrees. You know, where they're doing green infrastructure. 
you know, the judges are smart and they put in a requirement for the maintenance. As I mentioned in the Kansas City example, they had to be in the public right away because it was the city's responsibility to maintain these and they will and they do. You know, but and 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 the same thing in Seattle, they do it also in, in their C streets in most cases. But in most situations, you put in a inlet filter in the middle of a parking lot or porous pavement in the back of an apartment building, those never get maintained. And there and there's no regulation to do that. And, and so we're really missing, you know, some really basic uh, parts of the puzzle there. And, and again, you know, Center for Water Protection, et cetera, et cetera, have done a tremendous amount of work on evaluating maintenance and maintenance problems. So we know how to do it and know it's there. We're missing, we're missing the actual regulatory component associated with the maintenance. Yeah, we're required to report that we did it, right? But <laughs> do we know we're doing it right and all that? Mike, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so um, I, number one, I love maintenance. Um, it's, uh, it's like one of my passions. Uh, so. I would note that I, what I kind of see is there, there's critical, critical points, right? So the first one is establishment maintenance, the confirmation before the release of the contract that the seed that's germinated is actually the, the vegetation that you want and not just uh, green. Uh, two, that the performance uh, is actually uh, there uh, so that your, your anticipated performance is the performance you're getting prior to the release of the contract. Then to note that vegetation uh, and establishment of that vegetation doesn't just occur uh, over a month or two. It takes a couple of years, and there needs to, you know, there needs to be extended maintenance periods during that first two years to get the vegetation established. Because what that's really the system. Uh, the basin isn't really the system, in my opinion. It's the vegetation that holds the system together. So um, then, then when it comes to the long-term maintenance, I think we 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 categorize, we have two pieces, right? We have the functional maintenance and we have the aesthetic maintenance. So the good news about the basin in the back of the apartment building is that doesn't really have a fun, uh, an aesthetic value. It's all a functional value. And that maintenance is much uh, cheaper and easier to perform than those curb cut rain gardens out in front of people's houses in, uh, in Kansas City. Um, so I like dividing those up and, and just knowing as you're going into the project that if you're doing a curb cut rain garden on a residential street, uh, your aesthetic uh, maintenance is going to be high uh, and your establishment is going to be even higher uh, to get those um, to be formal gardens. But in the back of apartment buildings, we essentially inspect ours every two years and find after establishment, find uh, very few maintenance issues uh, that can't simply be solved with a hand crew. Very rarely do we need to bring in excavators or dump trucks to, to rejuvenate or uh, repair those systems. Yeah, I just want to reinforce two things out of that, that construction diligence, right? Did you get what you paid for, right? When it's done with construction, is it functioning the way you expected it to in the design phase? Uh, and then number two, the handoff. The handoff is not just a single point in time. There is a transition period where it needs more attention after construction is complete to make sure that it gets to Again, that point of expectation, where is it actually a fully functioning or a fully mature, if you want to think about it that way, operating practice? So what other comments on maintenance do our panelists have? I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I can't really comment on this engineering topic. But what I, what I do get poked with and hear a lot about is if you build something, how long is it going to last? And I often, you know, in particular, you know, I'm thinking the media type filters. And I say, I don't know, you're gonna to have to monitor. And the response is, we don't want to monitor, that's too expensive. So the, the question is, how long is it gonna last? How do you know without monitoring? You know, if you have 2000 ponds, I know we're currently kind of engaged in a study to figure out, you know, simpler ways to figure out when these ponds are no longer performing the way we expected them to. So the large numbers make it hard and monitoring is expensive. So knowing when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, I think is, is a, is a big challenge. Yeah, I'll just tack on a statement or two right on top of that. Uh, again, I think there's an opportunity, a research opportunity there for, you know, whether it's an application of some type of sensors and sensor technology is also changing very rapidly. Um, some type of hydrologic sensor or water quality sensor or conductivity sensor. 
that could be emplaced in some of these systems that could somehow trigger, hey, we have a problem here. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. And that gets to assessment, right? How do we how do we ensure, how do we measure or even failure? How do we measure failure? And what what level of failure is it? There can be a um, you know, what we call a major failure. We have to rebuild the whole thing. And as Mike was saying, oftentimes if, if you're doing the routine, the regular maintenance, and even the non-routine maintenance, the simple things, corrective actions, you can avoid that major maintenance or major rebuild on most practices if you're diligent about it, right? But then are there, be are there better ways than monitoring to actually assess that and find that? Uh, so I, that actually leads into it. It's a question that we got from our, from our audience talking about, you know, some of these BMPs are installed by guidelines, rules of thumb. Maybe they're designs that were implemented in another state and they're brought to a local place, but we don't have any local performance uh, measurements. At the very beginning of this, you know, Bob mentioned the power and the, the value or importance of pilot studies in your location. And I, I want to reiterate that because I do think that's important. If you're going to bring a new technology to a new region, maybe a pilot scale is a great way to test the concept, right? It, will it work in that region under your climate conditions, your temperature regimes, um, your biological, maybe the vegetation needs to be changed, right? The vegetation palette. But the question I want to ask is about assessment, performance, translating that. And that, that tags on to right what Dr. Davis was just saying, you know, are there other sensors? Are there other ways? So I don't know if the panelists have some expertise or comments on ways that we can measure performance outside of monitoring that will give us ideas of performance. Do we need maintenance? What do we need to do to keep these systems functioning? I noticed that uh, Jane Clary gave a presentation and I'm sure it was about the BMP database. You know, and as we know, that's a wonderful resource, but we also have to recognize those are quote, perfect systems in, in almost all cases. And so that is kind of the goal. You know, so in reality, we're performing less probably than what we're seeing in the database, you know, because they're maybe not designed as well, you know, but certainly they may not have been maintained as well. And so what, you know, the things, and, and Jim Nunhart mentioned the use of the data logger uh, uh, ele elevation. I use those all the time, you know, in order for uh, developing, you know, standing water conditions. You know, how fast is this device draining? Is, you know, is it draining at all? You know, is it, is it um, functioning? You know, certainly the, the aesthetic evaluations, as mentioned, certainly is our outlet clogged, you know, on a, on a pond. You know, what type of vegetation is growing you know, and creating uh, problems associated with obvious uh, problems in that situation, uh, sediment buildup. You know, obviously there's a lot of visual things, but you have to go there, you know, on that. But I, I really like the that loggers. But again, we have limited battery life. You know, we have to still get out there and download them and things like that. But things like that we've used an awful lot that have been pretty simple and inexpensive to be able to determine if these things are functioning. Other comments on that? We're, we're really depending on uh, just uh, regular inspections. And what we're finding is uh, we, we worked in partnership with the Conservation District, the Soil and Water Conservation District in Washington County. And they established a, uh, an inspection and maintenance crew for essentially green infrastructure, best management practices. Um, and we're finding that it's a great partnership because, you know, like in, in our area, the watershed district has practices, uh, the cities have practices, the school district has practices, and the county has practices. Uh, and the conservation district has a lead, a crew lead who's a permanent full-time employee, uh, and then currently has uh, temporary or seasonal employees that do the maintenance. And it's essentially... Uh, it's a knowledgeable staff with a truck and hand tools um, that are maintaining all of these practices for a really very little money every year. And it's just taking care of for all of those uh, government units. So um, would, that actually for us is a cheaper solution than, uh, than, than monitoring. Yeah, Andy, um, I guess following up a little bit with what you and, and Bob had said, certainly it is important to understand 
your site to understand the drainage area. That is absolutely critical when you're putting in these systems. On the other hand, um, a lot of these systems we know to be fairly robust. And you know, a lot of us have heard, yeah, that'll work at your place, but it just won't work at mine. But yet, you know, we've traveled all over the place, but and they're working at these places. There has to be tweaks and adjustments, uh, absolutely, depending on your climate and, and so forth. But for the most part, um, these technologies are, are pretty transferable to a lot of different places. Yeah, I think that's I think that's an important piece. I like how Bob described it. There are, there are some practices that are maybe fragile, right? And there's others that are robust. And I, I, I agree. I think a majority are robust and you might have to have slight design modifications or plant palette changes, things like that. But um, the fundamental mechanisms, right, the unit processes of filtration, infiltration, chemical sorption, things like that, biological processes, uh, you know, those are well known, well established. And if we can actively have those working, then you're probably going to get good results, right? Uh, are there any other comments on that piece, assessment? I love what Mike said about inspections and relying on inspections. We think you can get a lot out of inspections, right? And, and simple sensors even, water level sensors and things like that. There are some simple ways to get good measures of performance to at least tell you, is it working? Uh, and do you need maintenance? Anything else on that? If not, then uh, I'm gonna pivot a little bit again. Uh, and actually we've been talking a lot about, and actually historically, there's been a big focus on these, what you might call final BMPs or permanent BMPs or full scale uh, best management practices, stormwater control measures, like bioretention, permeable pavement, stormwater ponds, tree trenches, things like that. But what about our pretreatment practice? Bob mentioned it in his uh, talk, there was a piece in there talking about pretreatment, and I want to I want to come to that. There's a question from the audience from Mike Trojan asking about pretreatment and also source control, right? That's a piece that we haven't talked about yet today. So I'd like our panelists to kind of comment on the value and importance of pretreatment. What does that give us in these systems, as well as source control and how that actually affects uh, what we're talking about today? A lot of that goes together, you know, because most of the source control devices that I've developed and installed are treatment trains. You know, you have to incorporate, you know, multiple unit processes. Sedimentation in the front end is, is critical, and, and there are many ways that we can do that from a simple grass swale, you know, to some type of a tank, you know, to lamella plates, whatever. And then we go into <clears throat> our filtration systems as an example. So pretreatment, I think, is very critical. If we don't have pretreatment, we're going to have premature failure, premature in the sense of not meeting our expectations, possibly. And they're also much more fragile because we could have a landslide, we could have a fire, you know, a house fire even, you know, it could come down and, and totally kill our very expensive media system. You know, having some type of a pretreatment location that helps to be able to retain that. You know, so uh, pretreatment, I think, is extremely critical and extremely important. You know, it may not be so obvious looking at a device, but, you know, we may have a sedimentation area before it goes into the media. That, that's very, very important. You know, even some of the inlet filters I've developed and we have pretreatment in there before it goes through the, the media. You know, so critical source areas, again, that's, that's very important, but I wanted to make the point again that we can go through and, and we need to do it. We need to identify these critical areas. We need to control them, but that's not all we have to do because we have a very small fraction of the flow in most urban areas coming from those critical areas and, and, and possibly a, a, a small, relatively small fraction. It's not 80% coming from 20% of the area. That's not happening. You know, so we're going to have to have you know, uh, critical source area control. So mainly so we don't foul up the downslope control device or anything else, but we also need to be able to deal with larger scale systems that are going to be able to take, you know, the, the more typical drainage from larger areas. I keep going back to your pond examples, you know, from that, you know, but we got to have the critical source area controls in there also. And we have plenty of tools for that, but then it goes into the maintenance issue, you know, is that those are very challenging to maintain or to get maintained. They're just forgotten about, you know, so 
that, that, that all fits together. <clears throat> Everything we've been talking about all fits together. You know, we got to do, you know, uh, it's, there's, not, there's not a simple solution. And again, we talk about the groundwater. It's not a simple solution or a simple answer, you know. So we got to understand our resources, understand the soils, understand the groundwater, understand the variability, understand the seasonality, the runoff quality and quantity, you know, understand our, our control practices, uh, you know, uh, combinations of controls that are going to be able to address this issue, different locations overall. I mean, it's just a huge mammoth thing. Of course, we can do all that with wind slam. <laughs> no offense. But again, that's kind of why we developed that is to be able to enable us to look at how these different systems work together. It's very challenging to do it otherwise, but you have to have a tool or a think thought process to be able to address those different components of our systems. Yeah, that was, that was a great list, Bob. And I agree with it. And the, the one item I would add that we found is critically important is what is what is your res what are your resources uh, for actually maintaining those? So I know, for example, for MnDOT in the county, uh, they have crews uh, that only use equipment. Uh, they don't want uh, to have uh, crews to come out and use shovels and wheelbarrows, uh, for example. Uh, so we need to make our uh, all of our pretreatment. Uh, large enough to, to know that it's not going to be maintained every year uh, and, and that it's a, accessible and maintainable only with heavy equipment, back trucks, skid steers, dump trucks. Uh, for, um, for our small municipalities that have maybe one public work staff, uh, if that many, uh, then we're really focusing on controls that um, can be maintained by hand crews uh, because those are the most accessible and, and affordable uh, in our area. So shallow, what we call shallow sumps with permeable weirs uh, is the approach that we're taking. Um, so it can be uh, simply removing a grate and uh, using a shovel and a wheelbarrow with a dump trailer. So um, all of those, pretreatment is super complex, but it, it's probably one of the most important considerations uh, for the longevity and the maintenance of the practice. I love that, Mike. You know, I've, I've seen a number of uh, design with maintenance in mind, presentations and sessions and things at conferences. Uh, I don't remember if anybody ever said, well, think about who's doing the maintenance in the, in the crews, who are the end users, right? I mean, people talk about, uh, think about who can do it, but not what they do it with, right? Is there, are there big uh, equipment crews or are they hand shovel crews, right? So I love that. And I think that is a very important point. Other comments on this question? I, I want to uh, support Bob's comment. Tree treatment is really important. I'm surprised how uh, well some of these small retention ponds do perform relative to these more uh, complex systems. But I, one thing to think about pretreatment that I don't think is thought about very often is that um, things can change. The chemistry can change those ponds once you do that pretreatment. So for example, if you have a fairly large pond and you're kind of targeting phosphate removal or, or phosphate and the pond starts growing algae and your phosphate is no longer phosphate, it's inside the algae. So the chemistry can change in your ability. The pretreatment, just think a little bit about the pretreatment, how it may change that chemistry and how what you're targeting uh, may change as well. So not only is the, the inputs variable, we're changing it, right? It's a, it's a transient dynamic system through our treatment systems. Uh, we change particle size distributions. We change uh, the chemistry or the phase, whether it's, it's solid or dissolved uh, through these systems. And is, does it become organic <laughs> at some point in the system? And how do we deal with that, right? So, so that gets to uh, pretreatment source controls a little bit. I do want to mention too, I think, you know, something that hasn't talked, we haven't talked about a lot. We've talked a lot about treatment. You know, what do you put at the end of the pipe or somewhere at, in the pipe? But I also want to mention uh, source control in the, in the sense of like things like street sweeping, right? And, and education of the public and homeowners and what do they do with their grass clippings or what do they do with their leaves? Uh, those can be big, big, big wins and very cost effective too when you're talking watershed scale, right? Um, so think about that, but, but Keith's point about, you know, as it's, as your water, as your stormwater is moving through your system, the chemistry, the biology, all of that stuff changes over time. And if you have some of these source controls like street sweeping, 
that changes what ends up in the runoff coming to your bioretention or your biofilter or even your stormwater ponds. So think about that, keep that in mind. Those can be big wins. Uh, I also wanna mention pretreatment. I wanna, I wanna reiterate also, pretreatment can be easier to maintain, right? These smaller systems, if they're chambers, things like that, it can be a lot easier to get sediment out of a chamber than it is to dredge that sediment out of a stormwater pond. So just think about that. That, is, that can be very valuable, very cost-effective. Again, depending on who can do the maintenance or who's responsible for the maintenance, what do they have available for them? What's cost effective for them? So we're closing in very quickly on the end of our time. Here, I want to uh, ask one more question before we get to our closing question. And that question is for our panelists, what do you think are the most important knowledge gaps? What is, what do we not know right now? What do we need right now in the immediate future to help us advance? this topic and advance what we know about these systems. So what would you say are the most important knowledge gaps related to this topic? And I'd like, a, if, if everybody has a response, I'd like a response from each of the panelists if possible. Yeah. I'm gonna go back to Alan's comments about emerging contaminants. And we, we're doing PFAS research now uh, on the West Coast and a few other locations. We're looking at emerging contaminants, uh, pharmaceuticals. We looked at that and what other flows. Those are all very, very critical things, but we don't want to forget the basic stuff too, the sediment mainly thing. And also the variability that he pointed out, John, how, how does that affect performance? I mean, yeah, uh, I, I mentioned in my presentation that we have to simulate the natural conditions as much as possible, but it's hard to do that micro variation, you know, that, that we see in, in the field. So I think those points that he brought out are, are very critical in, and needs you know, to, to go in, in the future on that. You know, and, the, and this whole concept of how these things work together on a large scale, you know, I think that that is very important that we just talked about briefly uh, recently. So a lot of, lot of stuff, a lot of, lot of uh, things that we don't even know about probably that still could use uh, some additional effort. That's great. What else, what else would you say are the most important knowledge gaps here from our panelists? I think there's just there's lots of knowledge gaps to me I think Bob hit on on the big ones that I would have said as well um, you know the variability that happens site to site even within a site um, the emerging contaminants we need to deal with and then I'll just uh, add something on top of that is ultimately where do these pollutants go and and Bob talked about some of that in the groundwater but yeah, we've got this great media that's accumulating pollutants and somewhere along the line, are we just going to landfill this and just keep continue to do this forever and ever and ever? So there's some long-term sustainability issues that need to be brought into it. Yeah, I really concur with that, with, with that comment. Um, and where I, where I really see the black box uh, is in bioremediation and really this, this advanced biochemical processes and catalysts. Um, there is, we, we, have a, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pollutants in, uh, but fewer pollutants out, but where does it go and what's actually happening in that black box? Um, I think there's a lot to learn there. And again, it just goes back to the point that we'll be going back and retrofitting these basins in 20 to 30 years uh, with microbial communities and plant communities that either transform or uptake uh, pollutants of concern. So we hopefully don't have uh, 20, 30 years from now, we don't have a process where we're actually removing the media and landfilling it. We're simply taking out the targeted pollutants and harvesting the plants and processing that. I guess I have to go last. Um, uh, I'm going to change the question if you don't mind a little bit. It's it. I don't, I don't know if it's knowledge gaps, but I think it's often knowledge transfer gaps, you know, which is the purpose of this seminar, right? So, I think um, I don't know if you figured out or not. I'm not an engineer, but I'm more of a chemist than an engineer. So, um, I think this, even though this is traditionally an engineering field, I think it is becoming more of a, a multidisciplinary field, and I think. Um, you know, we're, we're venturing in an area where it does take 
biologists, chemists, and engineers to kind of work together to share knowledge to address these these uh, more complex uh, treatment approaches. So I think it is transfer and inclusion of different knowledge groups, I think is, is important. Yeah, and I think the being able to translate these biological processes, these chemical processes to engineers, that everybody kind of has a good working knowledge and working together in multidisciplinary teams is really what we're going to need, right? We can't rely on just simple sedimentation or simple filtration. We need a multiple unit process approach to get to all of these pollutants. Uh, and, I, and I love the comment too about uh, the dynamics, the transformation of these pollutants and, and Alan's question, you know, what happens to this stuff? Is it stable, right? And it gets to your point, Keith, about the water chemistry. When, when, not if, when the water chemistry changes, how does that affect the stability of these pollutants that we've captured in this bioretention media or biofiltration media, right? Is it stable? Under what conditions is it not stable? What, what mobilizes it? Um, are there things that are transformed into gases, right? Are there organic chemicals transferred to carbon dioxide or, or nitrogen gas? If that, not, if that doesn't happen, what does happen with, those, with some of those pollutants? So I think those are all big uh, research areas that we could dive into. You know, I, I love this field. I love the field of stormwater because it seems like the research topics are endless. <laughs> So, um, so what I want to do now, I want to move into the close for our seminar. We're just going to take a few more minutes and get our key takeaways from each of our panelists. And I'd love to close with the knowledge gaps, but I do think there are a lot of nuggets that we, we hit on today. And I want to make sure that those are reiterated right here at the end. So we're going to go through each panelist in the same order that I introduced everybody. So we're going to go Keith, Mike, Alan, and then finish up with Bob with the last word. And the question for you is, what are your key takeaways from today? What do you want our audience to remember uh, if you have some key points to give them? So I have to answer this, Andy? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's so many things touched upon today that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's challenging. I think um, maybe the, the key takeaway is it's, it's tricky. It's not, uh, you know, I took this study, it, it removes 70% of whatever. Therefore, if I build it here, we're good. So it's seen to me that there, there's a lot to consider uh, when you are building these, all the way from Bob's comments to Alan and Mike's about maintenance. It seems like it's, it's not as easy as digging a hole in the ground and putting water through it. So I, I think it's, Wow, there's a lot to, to think about and, and plan for when you build these things. I think that's a great response. Mike, what would you give as our key takeaways? Uh, mine really focuses around ensuring that your, your standards and your processes are, uh, are in place uh, and are up to date. Uh, bioretention has evolved a lot in the last decade and I struggle uh, with uh, getting uh, cross sections changed and uh, guidance change and testing methods into our construction process, um, and then um, and then also having um, uh, permit release or uh, or or contract release with contractors uh, after uh, we have well established and functioning systems. So if if we could all do that, I I think that. Uh, the, the, the big issue of maintenance would be uh, much, uh, much less uh, than it seems now, because I think a lot of folks are repairing uh, instead of just maintaining. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Davis, what would you give us as your key takeaways from today? Yeah, I like Keith's answer. I mean, the complexity is, is clear and, and we need to deal with the complexity and try to understand the complexity. Uh, I'll take that and lead into, I think, some, some key words that I know Bob mentioned and maybe others, and that's looking at these uh, uh, treatment systems as treatment trains. That, you know, understanding that if we want to target sp specific pollutants, there are ways to do that. The pretreatment process, um, various types of media, there are ways to, to do this that makes sense. Um, and you know, we may have a single BMP that may have may still be a treatment train. It may be layered or something along those lines to look at that way. 
And just to add another thing we didn't talk too much about, but the idea of really going back up in the watershed and, and you mentioned things like street sweeping, but um, you know, on the industrial side, there's no exposures, keeping things covered and, and even into product bans with which California has done a lot with, with banning products like um, you know, copper and brakes and, and things like that, that uh, that may be ultimately how some of our problems are solved. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. We need to think outside the BMP box, right? <laughs> There's a lot more that we can do. So, Bob, uh, you are a keynote speaker. You set the stage. You get to give us the last word. Well, don't get me going on street cleaning. I spent a lot of my career looking at that, you know, and uh, it's, there's definitely some limitations there, but we don't have time or the place to deal with that, unfortunately. But again, I think uh, there's a tremendous amount of information that we have available, a lot of research, a lot of good folks have been doing good work for decades, you know, and the regulations are kind of slow. You know, the acceptance of this field is kind of slow. It's not even an emerging field. You know, when we look at money being uh, spent, you know, in wastewater versus stormwater versus drinking water, that's appropriate, of course, but it's all one water, you know, that people have used. You know, we're dealing with the interaction of these different water streams, you know, and we need to we need to look at that. You know, the multidisciplinary approach that Keith brought up is, is critical. You know, um, I think a lot of our projects have dealt with that. You know, we've all wanted to hire a geologist, we wanted to hire a biologist or the chemist to work on our projects with us with engineers. So I think the problems are complex, but I think they're they're pretty solvable. We we have data showing that we we do have some good solutions out there, but we have more to do. Yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, there's, uh, as I said, there's a lot of work to do here. There is a lot of information. There's a lot of really good data out there. Look for those resources. We'll share some of those resources, uh, hopefully through the Q&A uh, document that'll go out to all the registrants. Uh, so with that, we will close this edition of the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. I wanna thank our panelists, Keith, Mike, and Alan for serving and give us great wisdom on this topic. I want to thank Bob for setting the stage with our keynote presentation. A lot of really, really good information shared there. I'm really excited to see this go on to YouTube. And uh, as Keith was saying, transfer knowledge to as many people as we can. That's really the goal of this Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. And for that, I'm also very thankful for all of our participants, uh, both live and those that watch it later on YouTube. Um, we're very thankful for you. We hope this uh, gives you information that you need and that helps you in your jobs to improve water quality in the long term. So with that, I will say thank you. Uh, and we hope to see you again in a future Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. Bye for now. <laughs>